My uncle was stationed at Messinium, in active command of the fleet. On the 24th of August, in the early afternoon, my mother drew his attention to a cloud of unusual size and appearance. He had been out in the sun, had taken a cold bath, and lunched while laying down, and was then working at his books. He called for his shoes and climbed up to a place which would give him the best view of the phenomenon. It was not clear at that distance from which mountain the cloud was rising. It was afterwards known to be Vesuvius. Its general appearance can best be expressed as being like an umbrella pine, for it rose to a great height on a sort of trunk and then split off into branches. I imagine because it was thrust upwards by the first blast and then left unsupported as the pressure subsided or else it was borne down by its own weight so that it spread out and gradually dispersed. In places it looked white, elsewhere blotched and dirty, according to the amount of soil and ashes it carried with it. My uncle's scholarly acumen saw at once that it was an important enough for a closer inspection, and he ordered a boat to be made ready, telling me I could come with him if I wished. I replied that I preferred to go on with my studies, and as it happened, he had himself given me some writing to do. As he was leaving the house, he was handed a message from Rectina, wife of Tascus, whose house was at the foot of the mountain, so that escape was impossible except by boat. She was terrified by the danger threatening her and implored him to rescue her from her fate. He changed his plans, and what he had begun in a spirit of inquiry, he completed as a hero. He gave orders for the warships to be launched, and went on board himself with the intention of bringing help to many more people besides Rectina, for this lovely stretch of coast was thickly populated. He hurried to the place which everyone else was hastily leaving, steering his course straight for the danger zone. He was entirely fearless, describing each new movement and phase of the portent to be noted down exactly as he had observed them. Ashes were already falling, hotter and thicker as the ships drew near, followed by bits of pumice and blackened stones charred and cracked by the flames. Then, suddenly, they were in shallow water, and the shore was blocked by the debris from the mountain. For a moment, my uncle wondered rather to turn back, but when the helmsman advised this, he refused, telling him that fortune stood by the courageous, and they must make for Pompanius and Stabai. He was cut off there by the breadth of the bay, for the shore gradually curves around a basin filled by the sea, so that he was not as yet in danger, though it was clear that this would come near as it spread. Pomponianus had therefore already put his belongings on board ship, intending to escape if the contrary wind fell. This wind was of course full in my uncle's favor, and he was able to bring his ship in. He embraced his terrified friend, cheered and encouraged him, and thinking he could calm his fears by showing his own composure, gave orders that he was to be carried to the butt to the bathroom. After his bath, he lay down and dined. He was quiet, cheerful, or at any rate, he pretended he was, which was no less courageous. Meanwhile, on Mount Vesuvius, broad sheets of fire and leaping flames blazed across several points, their bright glare emphasized by the darkness of night. My uncle tried to allay the fears of his companions by repeatedly declaring that these were nothing but bonfires left by the peasants in their terror, or else empty houses on fire in the districts they had abandoned. Then he went to rest and certainly slept, for as he was a stout man and breathing was rather loud and heavy, and could be heard by people coming and going outside his door. By this time the courtyard giving access to his room was full of ashes mixed with pumice stones so that its level had risen, and if he had stayed in the room any longer, he would have never gotten out. He was awakened, came out and joined Pomponius, and the rest of the household who had sat up all night. They debated whether to stay indoors or take their chance in the open, for the buildings were now shaking with violent shocks and seemed to be swaying to and fro as if they were torn from their foundations. Outside, on the other hand, there was the danger of falling pumice stones even though these were light and porous, however, after comparing the risk, they chose the latter. In my uncle's case, one reason outweighed the other, but for the others, it was a choice of fears. As a protection against falling objects, they put pillows on their heads and tied down with cloths. Elsewhere, there was daylight by this time, but they were still in darkness, blacker and denser, 
than any ordinary night, which they were revealed by the lighting torches and various kinds of lamps. My uncle decided to go down to the shore and investigate on the spot, the possibility of any escape by sea, but he found the waves still wild and dangerous. A sheet was spread on the ground for him to lie down, and he repeatedly asked for cold water to drink. Then the flames and smell of sulfur, which gave warning of the approaching fire, drove the others to take flight and roused him to stand up. He stood leaning on two slaves and then suddenly collapsed. I imagine because of the dense fumes choked his breathing by blocking his windpipe, which was constitutionally weak and narrow and often inflamed. When daylight returned on the 26th, two days after the last day he had been seen, his body was found intact and uninjured, still fully clothed and looking more like sleep than death. That was the actual letter that Pliny the Younger wrote, giving us a uh, recollection of how this uh, volcanic eruption actually went down. And uh, it's it, kind of an interesting fact here. This was, uh, according to his account, on August the 24th. On August the 23rd, they had a, a, cer a ceremonial uh, ritual of which they paid their homage to the fire god, Vulcan. So just a kind of interesting, you know, fact there that on the 23rd, they're, they're paying their homage to the fire god. And then on the 24th, this volcano erupts and and they've never seen anything like this before uh, you have to keep in mind they, they've never seen a volcano they didn't know if they needed to run they had no idea this is just a big mountain that they didn't even know was a volcano it is now spitting out uh ash and and you know fire and everything else and big rocks so uh i know some of you guys in here were planning on doing some some of your own research and stuff did anybody uh actually look into that has anyone done any research on this? Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I've done really much research, but uh, I did find the the writing style that you can you can see in the in the letters very fascinating because it's very matter of fact. And even though you know, as you mentioned, there was a uh, homage to the fire god the day before. Normally, Greek writers would immediately uh, tie those two together and and mention time and time again in in the letter how it was probably tied to that, but you see how Pliny the Younger doesn't actually do that at all. So that's a very fascinating thing because that's a very uncommon and very rational for a uh, for a Greek. And there may be actually some um, explanation to that because I don't know if maybe he had his dates mixed up or what because. Um, the discoveries that we found, they've actually said they believe it would have been later in the year, like uh, November or December, because since they found it, they've actually looked at the clothes and stuff that they were wearing. I, I don't know how they, <laughs> they were able to look at the clothes, but that's what the records say, that you know, based on the clothes that they were wearing, uh, it looked like it was been colder and later in the year than August. Right, right. But that's the interesting thing, because you don't... I mean, we don't really have all that much research on the uh, the effect of a um, God. I'd say this a, a a an explosion or a, a volcano like this. So I don't think you know maybe maybe we get the carbon dating that we do with uh, the clothing wrong because you know he, he even said it in the letter himself that uh, when they found the dead body like two days after it was still perfectly preserved it as if he had not decomposed at all which is i mean in two days that's kind of unusual yeah exactly well one thing i will say here is that uh plenty the younger does seem to be a little bit dramatic uh later on we're gonna we're gonna look at his ghost stories got maybe it's just real i don't know <laughs> But nevertheless, I, in his writing style, even, I've noticed that he does tend to, I think, you know, just based off his writing, I'm taking a guess here to say he was probably a bit dramatic and he liked to sort of overinflate things, you know, when he could make a real story out of something. So, uh, you know, it, I don't know if I'd take it, you know, word for word as fact, but uh, we do know that this did happen. We found 
the basically the buried city of Pompeii and found all kind of cool discoveries because of it. Uh, one of which, of course, was the date. But I believe this is one of the first recorded volcanic eruptions uh, like this. Not, not mm-hmm. that we know about, but like this. And to, to kind of put yourself in this, uh, this position that they're in, you have to imagine these men, though. I mean, rather right, right than not, they had just worshipped the fire god the day before or not, though. Imagine uh, seeing this, this, this massive wall of smoke and everything coming, not even knowing if you should run or not. Then it's suddenly hailing. It's like hail, but it's just small stones, and those stones get bigger and bigger until finally you've got rocks just busting through your ceiling and collapsing your house. This had to be terrifying for them. And then to have somebody like Pliny the Elder who charges into this. I mean, it really was an act of courage. It really was, especially knowing that you you didn't have any idea of what you were going into. You have to imagine this cloud. It's blotting out the sun. It's pitch dark. can't see anything. This, to them, would have been terrifying. They would have had no idea. And you have a man that's that's manning up his, his ships, and he's sailing right into this thing trying to rescue people. It's quite the story of courage, I have to say. Right, right. Because I think, um, I don't know if you already read this letter that still want to come, but because I wasn't really paying all that much attention, to be honest. Um, but there was, uh, at the end of one of his letters, it did say that uh, Pliny the Young was actually like thinking about this whole thing and then and saying that he was not crying or anything purely because he thought it was the whole world that was collapsing in on itself. I was thinking, um, I have to look up the actual quote of what he actually said, but um, here it is. Uh, I could boast that not a groan or cry of fear escaped me in these perils, but I admit that I derived some poor consolation in my mortal lot from the belief that the whole world was dying with me and I with it. So, you know, that that oh, yeah. really does indeed portray just how how disturbing this event must be, especially for somebody who doesn't know what a volcano even is. In their mindset, man, they had to have thought for sure that the gods had decided to just eliminate humanity, that they had they had infuriated the gods and that the gods were coming at you know coming for vengeance and they were going to wipe out humanity. I mean, that has to be what was going on through their minds. Sure, sure. Yeah, I imagine a lot of fear and confusion would be there. Um, I think you're probably right. Uh, I'd really like to know if uh, if they had really, you know, I mean, there'd be a lot there, right? I mean, what would be going through your mind if uh, you had really, if they really were worshiping the sun, the fire god the day before? You know, that would be, uh, that, I guess that would really just pile up on all of it. Uh, quite interesting, but... I know for a long time, uh, I think this was discovered in the 16th century, right? And for a long time, people didn't think that uh, the way he was describing a lot of this could have possibly have happened. But it's only actually recently with the scientific discoveries that we made that we found that it really could happen the way he said. Uh, Different types of eruptions and stuff, the way, you know, uh, just stuff that may not happen with every volcanic eruption, but now it, you know, we, we know it will, so... We we're not even you know we're just now getting to where we understand what he's saying to us here. Right, right. Because from what I understand, like the uh, the eruption of Pompeii was like, like the worst that we've ever seen. I don't think there's actually ever been anything quite as bad as it uh, to this date, even. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. And we're, I guess we can, uh, yeah. We've got a we've got a cool ghost story here too. If you guys want to jump in on that, you want to or you want to keep talking about this. Anyone else got anything to add here on the volcanic eruption? Um, I just want to emphasize that since this was ancient times and we didn't have photos yet, or we didn't have really anything to show the damage without people actually traveling down and seeing it, that the reason he might be so dramatic and so 
over the top in his portrayal of the excruciating detail of every little event that was shown in the letter would probably because would probably be because that he was trying to visualize it or give somebody basically food for thought so that they could more or less feel like they were there. I think that's a good point. And, and to also add to that, that you're talking about, uh, you know, plenty of the younger's uncle, plenty of the elder died here. So the last thing you, I mean, if that was your relative, you wouldn't downplay it by any means. You, know, you wouldn't uh, make it sound less than it was. You, you might uh, overdo it a little bit, even if the facts are intact, you might, uh, you know, it's going to be more dramatic to you. In other words, when you're writing it down, it's going to be more dramatic and more important than you. You're not just going to simply dry, cold, put down the facts. You're going to explain it probably a little further than you typically would. So that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. Well, uh, let's see here. I'm going to pull up, uh, the ghost story. This was pretty cool. Uh, this was his, uh, this was his one of another one of his letters that he wrote, and it's just like I said, a ghost story. Let's take a listen. There was in Athens a house, large and spacious, which had a bad reputation as though it was filled with pestilence. In the dead of night, a noise was frequently heard resembling the clashing of iron, which, if you listen carefully, sounded like the rattling of chains. The noise would seem to be a distance away, but it would start coming closer and closer and closer. Immediately after this, a specter would appear in the form of an old man, emaciated and squalid with bristling hair and a long beard, and rattling the chains of his hands and feet as he moved. The unfortunate inhabitants of the house went sleepless at night due to the unimaginable and dismal terrors. Without sleep, as it had happened to others, their health was ruined and they were struck with some kind of madness. As the horrors in their minds increased, they were led on a path towards death. Eventually, even during the daytime when the ghost did not appear, the memory of their nightmares was so strong that it still passed before their eyes every waking moment. Their terror was constant, even when the source of fear was gone. Because of this, the house was eventually deserted and damned as uninhabitable, abandoned entirely to the ghost. In hope that some tenant might eventually be found who was ignorant of the house's malevolence, a bill was still posted for its sale. As it happened, a philosopher by the name of Athenodorus came to Athens at that time. Reading the bill for the house, he easily discovered the price, and being an intelligent man, he was suspicious at its extremely low cost. Someone did tell him the whole story, and yet he wasn't dissuaded, but was instead eager to make the purchase, and thus he did. When evening drew near, Athenia Doris asked for a couch to be readied for him at the front of the house. He asked for his writing materials and a lamp, and then asked his retainers to retire for the night. In order to ensure that his mind stayed focused and away from distractions and stories about imaginary noises and apparitions, he poured all of his energy into his writing. For a while, the night was silent. Then the rattling of fetters began. Athenodorus would not lift his eyes or set down his pen. Instead, he concentrated on his writing and thereby closed his ears. But the noise wouldn't stop, and it only increased and drew closer until it seemed to be at the door and then standing in his very chamber. Finally, Athenodorus looked away from his work. He saw the ghost standing just as it had been described. It stood there, waiting, beckoning him with one finger. Athenodorus held up his palm, as though the visitor should wait a moment, and once again bent over his work. The ghost, impatient, shook his chains over the philosopher's head, beckoning again. This time, Athenodorus picked up his lamp and followed the ghost as it moved slowly, as though it was held back by its chains. Upon reaching the courtyard, the ghost suddenly vanished. Now, on his own, Athenodorus carefully marked the spot where the ghost vanished with a handful of leaves and grass. The following day, he asked the magistrate to have that spot dug up, 
and in that spot was found, intertwined with chains, the skeleton of a man. The body had lain in the ground for a long time, and had left the bones bare and corroded by the fetters. The bones were then collected and given a proper burial at public expense, and since the ghost tortured soul had been finally laid to rest, the house in Athens was haunted no more. So basically, I think every horror movie that you have ever watched rooted off of that letter right there. In before Hollywood takes it over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's get an applause in the chat. It says uh, Legatus Inferno. <laughs> that is, um, yeah, but that's a cool story, though. It really is. I mean, it's got all the elements of, of the just the, 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 the ghost story 101, you know, the haunted house, some guy buys it, he moves in, and, uh, oh, it's going to be fine, I don't care about the ghost, I don't believe in that, and then he's terrified and scared, and, you know, the, the end of the story, but it's a cool story, I imagine that would have been uh, quite the story back then, you know, to tell, mm -hmm. to, to share around a campfire or something. It's interesting because Athenio Doris was actually a real person. He was actually a Stoic philosopher, and um, I forget who wrote about him, but uh, most of the knowledge about his life comes from some other Greek philosopher. But um, apparently Athenio Doris was very vocal against Octa Octavian Caesar, who later became Augustus Caesar, the first Roman emperor. Yep, 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 yep. I was, I was, uh, when I was doing our research throughout this, I saw that as well. Found that to be interesting, the connections there, no doubt. So, I guess the major question here is this a uh, is this a work of fiction or was this an accurate telling of a real real event? What's your thoughts? Well, let's be honest, probably a work of fiction, but I do like the idea of this kind of being the. Uh, it's kind of like the origin story of exorcisms. Boo! I don't like your answer. That sucked. No, it's real. Come on, man. You know. <laughs> no, yeah. but yeah, I I know it's, but it is interesting. Uh, you know, I I wonder what the purpose of it was. Was it just to tell a story, uh, to pass down, or I mean, what was his motive there? Maybe maybe he killed the guy way earlier and then he he made the whole ghost story up he paid the people who lived there before to comply with it just so he could get away with it and tell everybody that he's an exorcist it was probably a christian he probably killed a christian and buried him down there i don't know <laughs> well that was um if you you'll he wrote some letters, um, actually asking for counsel on that. On how to? This was, uh, you know, plenty. Wrote some letters asking for counsel on how to deal with Christians because in his time as a lawyer, uh, Christians were, uh, you know, that was a punish. That was a punishable offense was to be a Christian. So, uh, in the letters, they say they're not going to go hunt these guys down, but it is punishable. So it'd be, you know. Uh, I don't know what you'd equate it to today. I mean, because it seems like everything then was punishable by death, but it'd be like uh, speeding tickets or something, you know? You, you'll you'll kind of look for them, but you're not just going to drive around looking for someone speeding or a seatbelt right, ticket right, or something. Right. More like, I guess maybe like a, a misdemeanor or something, but instead of getting a ticket, you get killed. <laughs> Yeah, kind of like that, sure. Um, I'm going to dig in, though. I, I really want to dig into the rest of his letters. If, if um, you know, you want to do further research here, uh, Plenty the Younger, he's got over 200 letters that are probably going to be very similar, similar to this. They're all going to be on different topics. But uh, these two, you know, the ghost story and the volcano are just the, the two most dramatic and exciting. Uh, they're very interesting events. You know, there's not uh, nearly as much to toss around and discuss because it's such an old event it's not quite like it would be today where you'd have you know so much uh documentation to discuss i mean really you can cover it in a pretty short period of time 
but he has a lot of letters that uh, will really give you, you know, eyewitness and firsthand account of his time frame. So I think it's probably worth investigating and looking into and reading those letters. You might learn a good bit. So yeah, anybody, uh, anybody got anything else you want to hop in here and uh, give us any more insight on what you think about it? I think everyone's scared. I think it's an interesting idea that the ghost could be some uh, Christian that was buried down there. But um, I think the story is just fictional, and Blimey just wanted to pull somebody probably more recent from history. The thing is how Stoic philosophy didn't really pick up in the ancient world until about 150 AD or so. So. These guys, uh, Pliny the Younger would have been one of the founding fathers, more or less, of Stoic philosophy, and it really got popular during the reign of Marcus Aurelius with his meditations. So, taking Pliny the Younger and putting him in a ghost story might be like putting Elvis Presley in some kind of a pop culture movie today. It'd just be like a good way to get back to the roots of something everybody's familiar with. Yeah, put a face, put a recognizable face with the story so it kind of connects to the audience a little bit, which in that in that time, of course, it would have, right? I mean, it would have, people would have known who it was, and it surely would have sparked their interest, especially if they knew who it was, if you were telling that story, like, well, wait a minute, I know him, what happened to him, you know? That would have definitely made for a cool story. Uh, I'm just wondering, I'm wondering how popular that was. I wonder what the response was to a story like that. Would it, would it have been... Uh, blasphemy of some type to even tell a story like that? Would it offend the gods, or was it perfectly acceptable to tell such a story? Before before I answer that question, I would uh, really quick just just tell everyone that I vote for Danny DeVito to play the ghost. I second that motion. <laughs> I heard. Right. All right, but yeah, yeah, it it would actually be very acceptable because you know a lot of stories were made about the gods and. and rapid succession you you had like 400 or 500 deities you know only most people didn't even know about half of them so i think that it's very plausible that these kind of stories were not only uh allowed but very much so liked because you know as if you can you just have to look at the greek mythology uh, mythology to know that they're they're big fans of fiction and and, and, and dramatization and poetry and all that stuff. I mean, they're basically the founding fathers of things like amphitheaters and, 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 and dramatization and plays and all that. You also got to realize the, uh, the fact that back then uh, they kind of just like thought of everything as to be true by these philosophers. Not sometimes they contested them when they knew something wasn't right. Obviously, some people actually saw this as a story and some people actually saw this as a, a reality. Because, you know, uh, let's say, uh, well, let's bring up religion in this case. We can talk about the Holy Ghost all we want. Whether it exists or not, we don't know. But people actually believed it did exist and so people would believe this actually happened. And this story is true. Yeah, good point. And uh, Chris, you're asking, um, uh, how were these letters discovered? Give me one second, I'll have that for you. Well, most of these letters probably would have been passed down. This is, I'm just taking an educated guess because... I'm sure there were manuscripts available, like with Marcus Aurelius and Cicero. They had these manuscripts available, and they eventually just got passed down through generation and generation. So as accurate as some of those manuscripts might be, they definitely got edited over time. So for all we know, this story could be completely changed, seeing as how it was written over 2,000 years ago. For all we know, the ghost kills our main character here, but I guess... For all we know, we're reading a completely different story than what was actually originally written. Well, that sure would be unfortunate, wouldn't it? I mean, because then the, the original story would have been way cooler. But 
<laughs> you know, it would have been a lot more interesting. But you know, yeah, it's. I want. I, why would they rewrite it though? Why do you think they would rewrite it, not just uh, leave it like it is? Well, the original story, seeing as how it was an ancient world thing, and they were very obsessive with death and gore and detail, i.e., the Colosseum and other things like that. It might have been. You might be right. Um, somebody brought up that it could have been a Christian, and when the Catholic Church took over and all those, um, all the uh, genitalia were removed from statues, certain stories were changed. It could very well be that they didn't want uh, maybe a perfectly good ghost story ruined in their eyes by the element of how they were able to. Um, I'm, I'm at a loss for words right now, but. Um, they were trying to basically whitewash it down and water it down so that it would be more appropriate for a newly Christianized Rome or wherever this story, um, I believe it's ancient Greek, you mentioned that earlier. So it, it could have something to do with um, a new religious impact on the ancient world. Yeah, and uh, Chris is wondering how he was able to uh, survive you know, since he was there himself, but he was actually, uh, um, he was not there with his, uh, uncle. He actually stayed. That was, uh, part of the first story there kind of skips right through it pretty quick, but plenty the elder, uh, is the one that went and took off to try to save all the people and plenty the younger did not go. He stayed. So, uh, while I think he actually did get some ash and some stuff like that, he was not in the bulk of, of all of it going on. So uh, he was just right outside of the the blast zone, I guess you could call it. He would have been at a safe enough distance that he could have seen everything that was going on without actually having to deal with it exactly firsthand. Yeah, I mean, in, in the beginning, I even said that uh, they could see it, like, from top of a hill and, like, leagues away from where that shit was happening. Because it's just breaking the hemisphere or whatever. <laughs> well, it was one of the biggest volcanic eruptions in human history, so I'm I'm sure you could have seen this in excruciating detail, probably from like a hilltop or hell, even a mountaintop. Exactly. I believe that exact same volcano is due to erupt again any moment to that same magnitude. That's an absolutely terrifying fact. Oh boy. Yep, yep. That's what I uh that's what I was led to believe. And I cannot remember where I saw it, but it says that it does it every two thousand years. That it should um it should go like that every two thousand years. Tick tock, tick tock. But um pretty much I, I was thinking about this. Um about the ghost story. Because I, I think when you're, when you're looking at it as a, a lens of is it fictional or is it not fictional, I think I might actually do the philosopher some discredit. Because, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a great philosopher here and a great mind. And, you know, maybe there's a more symbolic way to uh, interpret the, the story here. That's a good point. Um... I wonder what that would be. Uh, maybe I think I think you know I haven't thought about this for very long, but I think I have a, a little bit of a general answer to that. So it, it would kind of be like a, a moral of the story kind of thing, and then the general idea of that. And like I haven't really thought about this for much longer than five minutes. So excuse me if I get some stuff wrong here, but. Perhaps the, the symbolism was that you shouldn't run away from your from your problems, but rather face them. Um, as you can see, with the, the family runs away from their problem, they they are tortured uh, innerly a lot by said problem, and they they just run away and they they abandon everything they have, and you know they they run away from the problem, they lose everything, and then this guy comes around and he's courageous enough to to face a problem and he's awarded with that with a a house that's extremely cheap and extremely luxurious and like the best city in the world 
So maybe the simplest I would say is that like if you face your problems, you'll be successful a lot easier. And if you run away from your problems, you're going to end up in the gutter. Well, that plays in hand with uh, Stoic philosophy and seeing as how um, the main character, uh, I forget his name, I believe it was uh, Asendorus, and um, he was one of the founding fathers of Stoic philosophy in um, not exactly the early days, but just in um, <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, right around when it was starting to get its bones. It was um, portraying him as somebody that um, would stand up to his problems and then reaping the rewards of what he does, therefore putting the ghost at rest and getting this fabulous house that plays very hand in hand with Stoic philosophy and meditations. Marcus Aurelius goes on very much about how if you remain calm and take every problem as it comes, and eventually you'll reap the benefit of going through and just keeping a cool head. So, actually, I think you might have a point there. It might not just be a ghost story, it might be a commentary on Stoic philosophy. Oh, fucking genius. Anybody else got anything to add to that, or...? Uh, I think it's Hoost is trying to talk, but I can barely hear her. I'm here, sorry. I think my uh, earbuds are broken. Um, so, I have... I don't know, this is just a thought that I have. Um, so, in the beginning of the story, when it's establishing the ghost and the history of what it is and, and how it's... Um, you know, gone around and um, terrorized people. Um, it says that the like the people who were living in the house before, um, basically that it you know it drove them to sleeplessness and then eventually disease and death. And I'm just wondering. I don't know if this just indicates that it's more of a fictional story or something, or or maybe not, or maybe it's a an indication of some sort of like a cultural difference. But if that happened, I mean, it happens, you know, today where people believe that their house is haunted because weird shit is happening, and um, and people will just you know leave the house. <laughs> you know, I feel like that's sort of a natural. Um, reaction to leave um, and and you know just pack up and move somewhere else but I wonder why you know after so many sleepless nights to the point that it's making you sick why wouldn't you just leave then you know instead of it driving you to death I just wonder if there if it had something to do with I don't know again like maybe the gods maybe they just thought that that was, I don't know, they were being punished for something and they had to just like take it in stride or I don't know. I just find that really strange. Or maybe, it, like I said, it, it just indicates that maybe it actually is more of a fictional story than people take it for. I don't know. Well, that's a good point you're making. I, I think I explain that to, uh, to a fair degree. Um, there's the... the trend in, in human psychology that we get very attached to uh, where we kind of set up shop. That's why you uh, see a lot of nationalism and why why people like in this situation, they don't want to leave their home and uh, why when war comes, people don't run away and hide, or at least the, the great majority doesn't do that. And it has to do with the, uh, the natural claim for territory that a, a human being has and it, it's very it's a very um set in stone thing it's it's it's, it's very interlinked with the way we evolved from from primates and you know even primates show that that kind of um that that, that kind of, of attachment to their own territories and what they consider as their own territories and i, I think it, it's just very put into our our genetic uh, code to cling on to where uh, what you call home as hardest and, and and viciously as you can because it's it's kind of like your your material self I mean you you can look at it from a uh, perspective like this it's your house is like a uh, a material 
conception of, of your own mind. I mean, if you if you go ahead and, and clean up your own room, for example, you'll notice that you're uh, a lot less stressed and a lot less uh, confused about things as opposed to when your house is a mess. And you'll see when you have a, a tight schedule and what, what you do when in your own house that you also become more orderly and, and, and capable in, in the life beyond that house. So there's definitely a very strong link between um, a person's mind and a person's house. And perhaps there's some deeper meaning that I, I couldn't go into right now because I'm, I'm just not, um, I haven't thought about this more thoroughly. But perhaps the whole haunted house um, concept is something interlinked with um, your house not being in order or there being some kind of um, disconnect between your own mind and, and the house that you live in. Well, the play off of that would be, um, as you said earlier, it was a um, the house is a physical and materialistic perception of what your own mind is. Like a, a teenager will put up posters in his room of what he's interested at the moment. Elvis, I'm just going off of what I had in my room when I was a teenager. Elvis, you know, American flags, stuff like that. Just like um, in the ancient world, it would have been the people were a lot more nationalistic to be quite frank they were um they were very centered on who they were what their identity was what they did their culture essentially that was who they were as people so if if we want to go really in depth with this and just to play off what you said the the ghost haunting the house could be his um his house was left a meth a mess sorry at the time of his death and he never got to put not only his house but his mind back in order so it, it could be a play on that it could be a play on a, a combination of things but then we would have to get into the whole idea of are ghosts real and is there a connection between mind and matter is there a connection between the stuff you own and the energy you put onto it like um uh, religious people will put countless amounts of energy onto let's say a crucifix or another religious symbol so in the ancient world it would have been like the uh house deity the um uh whatever god you pray to to defend your home and all that sort of jazz but again i haven't had much time except for about 30 seconds to think about that i have another theory Athenia Doris was a very wealthy man. Maybe this was the first sign we can find of gentrification. That's an interesting <laughs> idea. <but. laughs> it's a joke. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Hold on. Trying to light the mood a little. Around the time. <laughs> Do what? Were there even Jews around at the time? Oh, sure, there were Jews at the time. The Jews have been around forever. That's that's true. Yeah, I, said, I said gentrification, not Jewification. What are you talking about? Oh, oh, I heard Jewification. <laughs> no, I did too. <laughs> no, no, gentrification. Oh, that that's a completely other idea. <laughs> wow. Gentrification? <laughs> oh, good lord. Is, is, is the ghost a transgender? <laughs> oh, do we all get to go on vacation if we change our genders? Ha ah. ha. Maybe that's a word that only exists here in the United States. I don't know. Gentrification. Y'all don't. You don't know what that word means. The no rich. Idea. Really? Not a clue. And I wow. Live here. Okay. Um. So the uh, definition of gentrification is the process of renovating and improving a house or district so that it conforms to middle class taste. Perhaps a ghost oh. was trying to tell us that he wanted to expand his kitchen. <laughs> Reveling in things like the garden is causing blues. Uh, he was haunted by those terrible appliances. Haunted by a mortgage owner. Okay, no, sir, that was a foreclosure. Money. He was haunted by the fact that his mortgage rates were going up. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all?
All right. Well, typically what we do here is we'll we'll close out the podcast. Uh, keep it short. It's coming up in about forty minutes, so we'll we'll just cut it off here. If y'all want to hang tight, though, we can just uh, you know keep talking a little bit in the voice chat. If you guys are going to be listening to us on YouTube, SoundCloud, Castbox, Twitch, and any of these other platforms we upload, I think we upload to like all of them now. Uh, there will be a link down there in the description. You can click on that. It'll bring you in here to the Discord server. We're called a closer look. And uh, we talk about history, politics, philosophy, just about anything you can think of. And we, of course, just have a little fun and joke around. So uh, come on in the Discord server. Join the conversation. You can actually be on the next podcast. This is a public and open podcast. We don't uh, do any kind of screening. Anybody can get on here. So if you want to come on and talk and, and listen, whatever you want to do, come on on. So till, uh, till the next podcast, we shall